From boardroom to Quidditch pitch, please help me welcome Mo Waja. The air is crisp and cold. You can feel it catch in your lungs with every breath. As you exhale, it plumes out in front of you, an ephemeral cloud quickly dispelled by the still morning air. Above your head, the sky is a brilliant blue, clear and cloudless, lit by the pale light of a winter sun. Most of the trees have shed their leaves, and those that remain lack much of their luster. But beneath your feet, the grass is resilient, still clinging to its summer green in spite of the thin sheet of glittering frost over top. At center pitch, you can see the balls lined up, the white quaffle flanked on either side by the red bludgers. One to the left, two more to the right. A little farther towards the end of the pitch, and you can see the opposing team's hoops. Thin posts varied in height, set equidistant apart, and crowned with dark rings. A low roar from the sidelines. The other team has finished their cheer, and your opponents have begun to file their starting line onto the pitch. A slow smile spreads across your cheeks. You look to your left and then to your right. Comrades, brothers and sisters in arms, the keeper with the green headband, the chasers with their white, and you and your partner, the beaters in the black. As one, you drop to a knee, wrapping gloved fingers around the thin PVC piping that serves the role of broomstick. Ready, a call from the head ref. You close your eyes, sucking in a slow, steadying breath, calming the stampede of your heart as you feel the toe of your cleat dig into the hard ground. It pushes back, supporting you, readying you. Brooms up. Immediately, you drive yourself into a sprint. The ground feels like it's pushing up beneath you, propelling you forward towards those balls at center pitch. To your left, the keeper is already most of the way there, stretching out an arm in anticipation of the quaffle. To your right, a blink, and your beater partner is halfway up the pitch. Her catch of the bludger seems assured, but your opponent reaches there before you. He raises the bludger, preparing to strike. You can't hit ball, so you strike body instead, tackling him, wrapping an arm around him and pinning his arm to his side, preventing the throw that would have unseated your keeper and forced him back to his hoops. You feel a tap on your back and the ref calls beat and you know you're out of the play. You dismount your broom and begin to jog your way back to your hoops. But a small smile plays about your lips, answered almost immediately by the shrill whistle of the ref. Your keeper has driven through the enemy lines and scored the goal. First blood is to your team. The score is 10-0. Your next breath is hot, smooth in your lungs, confident. This is the Quidditch Canada Eastern Regional Championships, and you've never felt more ready. So let's talk Quidditch. Quidditch is a sport that was built as a modern-day illustration of the game by J.K. Rowling. You have three chasers, one keeper, two beaters, and one seeker, all interacting simultaneously to bring that fantastical game to life. Right now, it is one of the fastest growing collegiate sports in America. How is it played? The chasers and the keeper pass a quaffle, in this case, a deflated volleyball, up the pitch to score in the opposing team's hoops. The beaters wield bludgers, dodge balls that they use to unseat their opposing players, causing them to dismount their brooms and run back to their side of the pitch. Think of them as the power players of the sport. Lastly, you have the seekers. In this case, people who chase the golden snitch, a runner dressed all in yellow with a flag tied to his back. Capturing that flag ends the game of Quidditch and scores your team an additional 30 points. It paints a compelling picture, one well worthy of the excitement and the intensity penned by J.K. Rowling in her Harry Potter series. Standing before you today, I have been a member of the Quidditch community for four years. But it was not always so. The excitement that I bring to you today, talking about Quidditch, the fierce joy that I feel every time I step onto the Quidditch pitch, was actually born of a deep reluctance, the first time I heard of the idea of Quidditch. And this is a reluctance that anyone who's ever had an interest or a hobby that falls beyond the norm might at some point have felt. For me, that reluctance can trace all the way back 
to a version of myself, a shallow teen in a high school in North Bay, Ontario. Now, that teen had a friend, and his name was Peter. He and Peter had almost everything that mattered in common. They loved the same video games. RuneScape was the RPG of the time. They loved all things sci-fi and fantasy. In fact, Peter had introduced him to his all-time favorite TV show, Stargate SG-1. Yet, there it is. <laughs> For all the connection that they felt, there was a flaw, and it ended up becoming a fatal one. You see, Peter was unpopular, worse so. He had no interest in attaining popularity, but to the young, shallow teenager who had never before felt popular, this was something that he coveted deeply, especially in the twilight years of his high school career. I remember one time I was walking down the halls of my high school with one of the quote unquote popular girls, and Peter and a friend were walking in the other direction. I threw them a wave, and immediately the girl said, why do you hang out with those guys? They're so weird. You'd be so much cooler if you just hung out with us. So I shrugged and shook my head and smiled and changed the subject, as an uncomfortable teenager is wont to do. But in the end, our friendship faded, becoming a casualty of the struggle within myself, the struggle between a friendship that mattered and the need to be popular, which I desired. Graduating high school, growing into the adult world, we like to believe that these pseudo-dilemmas that held us back are things that we have outgrown. That we can relegate these ideas to the world of mean girls and the breakfast club and high school musical. Yet the reality is that these social constructs persist, defying age and the experience that comes along with it. It's stunning how often we deny ourselves the pleasure of experience or the fellowship of friendship in favor of the empty promise of social approval, or worse, deny ourselves those pleasures in fear of being judged by a jury of our peers. And with the advent of social media, and as it has continued to grow, it is fair to say that that fear has only deepened it was so that when the idea of playing Quidditch was first approached with me, my heart may have leapt, my head and mouth laughed. I mean, what would they, that unnamed, undefined they, think of me, a student leader at the Ted Rogers School of Management, JDC debate champion, playing Quidditch, running around on a broom and pretending to be a wizard? This meant that I only joined the Quidditch community a year later than I otherwise might have. And since I have joined the Quidditch community, I have met a group of people who are exciting, competitive, and unbelievably compassionate. Since I have joined the Quidditch community, I have laughed more than I've lost, and I've gained more friends than have gone. But I get it. In today's day and age, we live in the world of the brand where everyone, many people at a very young age, are working at building their social brand across those social media channels. And we'd be remiss but to understand that that brand is a huge driver for them. So, from what I learned in Quidditch, to all the brands out there, I would say, take a step out of the boardroom. Live a life that you will love and the brand will build itself around you. But if you live for a brand that you think everyone around you will love, well, then life may very well pass you by. Thank you.